I'm going to talk to you about fungal asthma today. Um, and um, I need to remind you, because most of you will know, not all of you will know, but most of you will know, that aspergillus causes a variety of different infections. And the, uh, it causes acute invasive aspergillosis, sorry, over here, I can't see. Acute invasive aspergillosis in immunocompromised patients, so leukemia patients, transplant patients, uh, lymphoma patients, and AIDS patients uh, in particular. It causes disease in normal people, and uh, those are people often with a little damage on their nails or their eyes or their lungs, uh, but they're not a, 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 a immunocompromised formally. And then it causes allergic disease in those who are atopic and uh, particularly associated with asthma, although in, the, in Europe we have a lot of patients with cystic fibrosis and they get this <coughs> disease. And in other parts of the world there's quite a lot of allergic fungal sinusitis as well. So there's no other pathogen, there's no other microorganism that causes this spectrum of infection. If you consider CMV or uh, Cryptococcus or Campylobacter or uh, anything else, there's nothing else that will give this spectrum. So that's special, but it also challenges us on diagnostics, because if the same organism is causing multiple different diseases, how do we get the diagnostics right? It isn't just a matter of detecting the organism, there's also the whole diagnostic process. So I'm going to focus today on um, uh, fungal asthma, which is APPA and SAF, so I'll explain those words, and I will touch a little bit on chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, because it's one of the complications. Um, I've also, if, you, if we have time, we may not have time, I have a case history which we can, we can discuss as well. So how many patients are there? Um, we've actually made an assessment for Uganda, which was published about two years ago. But if you look at the world, we think that invasive disease is around 400,000. It may be more than that because it's underestimated in, because of diagnostic uh, failings. And if you don't treat invasive aspergillosis, you essentially always die. There are a handful of survivors. Um, it's not perhaps quite as bad as rabies, but it's pretty close if you're a bit of compromise with this disease. Chronic disease, one and a half to three million probably, probably at the top end of that, it's underdiagnosed. And about 75% of these patients die over five years if they're not diagnosed and treated. Some can be surgically treated, but the majority require medical therapy although there is a small group that are stable for a long period of time, and treatment does help. And then allergic disease, which is somewhere between 6 and 20 million people worldwide, almost all asthma, apart from cystic fibrosis, with uh, very low mortality overall, um, but I will address that in some uh, detail in, in, in another slide. So all of you who are physicians will know or feel that you know how to make a diagnosis of asthma. Usually this is straightforward. Um, the, the absolutely critical element is variable airflow obstruction, which varies typically through the day and is responsive to steroids. In this case, inhaled steroids, but it can be oral steroids. So it's this variable airflow obstruction, which is the hallmark of asthma, although there are a lot of different varieties of asthma. And asthma comes in many forms. You can have mild, moderate, or severe asthma. It's sort of thought that roughly 10% of patients have severe asthma or poorly controlled asthma. And ADPA, which I'll again come back to in detail, can affect any spectrum of asthma. It's more common if you have severe asthma, sort of about 50 to 60% of the patients are up at this end. But it can also occur people with absolutely no asthma at all. SAT, by definition, occurs in patients with severe asthma and it overlaps with ABPA, and the estimates we've got of fungal uh, asthma are overlapping in part. So if you try and define severe asthma, actually it's quite difficult. Um, it usually is defined by the treatment. It's usually defined by requiring a lot of steroid, either high-dose inhaled steroid, or continuous oral steroids, or multiple courses of steroids, and occasionally you can define it by having a uh, needing a, a trip to intensive care. Um, the problem with ADPA and severe asthma is that we treat ADPA with steroids. So by default, they become severe, although actually their asthma may not be that badly controlled. So there's a slight challenge in that group. Now, if you look at fungal disease across the world, I've mentioned chronic pulmonary with around 3 million cases. These are the cases of SAFs 
and ADPA, much smaller number of patients with ADPA and chronic bronchitis and cystic fibrosis. But this population here are in the 200 million adult asthmatics around the world. Okay? And if you look at that group, the mortality in the global burden of disease work suggests that there's around a third to half a million asthma deaths. Now, some of those deaths are going to be people who have no access to Ventolin or an inhaler, blue inhaler. Some of them will be there. But in the, um, in, in the, in the world, particularly the developed world, and also the middle-income countries, where treatment is common and commonly given, in fact, death is more common as you get older. It's uncommon. In Britain, for example, we have about 1,200 deaths with or from asthma every year, and about 12 are kids. All the rest are adults, particularly older adults. And severe asthma is associated with fungal allergy. So we suppose, but it's never been proven, and it needs to be looked at in detail, that some of the deaths are potentially avoidable because of fungal asthma. And very recently, we've had two estimates. Actually, this is the one from Russia of uh, fungal asthma in children, and it appears to be about 2% of the 100 million kids with asthma around the world. So these are fairly common problems, although the fungal piece is a small proportion of it, but it's the difficult piece of it. It's the bad, more severe asthma. Now, you can get aspergillus and fungus in the air, you can breathe it in. So you can either get infection or in colonization, either in the airways, or the upper airways or the lower airways, or you can be exposed to fungus, which is out there, and it hits you, but it doesn't really colonize. It doesn't grow inside the lungs very well. So many species of Altonaria and Cladosporium, which people are sensitized to, don't grow very well. But if you hit a cloud of it, which occurs after thunderstorms, for example, you can get quite bad asthma. And I'll explain why in a second. But the others are actually infection. And of course, trichophyton isn't a pathogen of uh, the lungs, it's a pathogen of the skin, or the toenails. So these are what the fungi look like. And those of you who like art, they're very pretty under the microscope, and they're very interesting, and all of those things. Um, but there, they are, there are some clear associations with worse asthma. So for example, in this study from Leicester in the UK, those who were sensitized to aspergillus, so that's what Richard was talking about, the IgE positive patients, had worse lung function, more bronchiectasis, and more sputum neutrophils. So despite the fact that it's an allergy, you've got a neutrophilia here, and a lot of the asthma world is moving in the eosinophilic asthma versus non-eosinophilic eosinophilic asthma in terms of treatment. And this seems to drive sputum neutrophils. And in India, in a study done of patients admitted to ICU with acute asthma, so really at the severest end of disease, um, they, in fact, they admitted 16% of their patients to ICU, so that's quite a big proportion. They compared that with about 750 outpatients. And those that were sensitized to aspergillus were common, over half those admitted to ICU, compared with about 40% who were defined in the outpatients, and outpatient has about 30% versus 21% there. So that again, this association of severe asthma with fungal allergy, and aspergillus allergy in particular. And there's also, a, if you take just a severe asthma population, and my colleagues uh, in, in Manchester run such a service, they get about 250 really difficult asthmatics through the, through the door every year. And they looked at quite a lot of those, and they, many of them had bronchial wall thickening, a third or so had bronchiectasis, some air trapping, bronchial wall dilatation. So these were the CS of the findings. But there was association with aspergillus sensitization and bronchiectasis. So there's this association with severe asthma, but there's also association with bronchiectasis. Um, now, how do you diagnose these diseases? Okay, so the first is you almost always have an underlying diagnosis, asthma or cystic fibrosis. Then you have a raised IgE for ABPA, which is more than a thousand. And there's two sets of units used here, which make life confusing. This is the international units. And then you have a skin test or an IgE test to aspergillus. And those are the key criteria for ABPA. You usually have eosinophilia. You may have IgG antibodies, which are what we call precipitins. And you often have abnormal chest x-ray with infiltrates that come and go. 
In contrast to SAFs or severe asthma fungal sensitization, where you have severe asthma, you have a skin test to any fungus, any filamentous fungus, some of them are allergic to candida, but we don't know what that means. And you haven't got ABPA. In other words, they haven't got an IgE more than that. Now, it's probably a little artificial, this distinction. It's not a perfect distinction, but it does separate them because these patients have other features, which I'll show you, which the SAFs patients don't have. So another way of looking at that, if you just take the aspergillus sensitization, is that the ABPA patients have these high IgE. It's 1,900, 3,000, so the normal is up to 100 in these units. And the sensitization levels are very high, 100 times normal. Okay? Whereas the SAVs, they're raised IgE and slightly raised, 10 times normal, 5 times normal sensitization. Now you can do a skin test like this, and here's an example of a skin test. This is a cladosporium positive skin test, but the patient's also got a positive control. Uh, house dust like cats, not dogs, but other pollens. And poly or multiple allergen sensitization is very common. We have a problem with the concordance of results between the blood tests and the skin tests. And the skin test reagents are also different. So different companies produce different results. So there isn't perfection in terms of what is IgE test. So in this group of patients with severe asthma, um, the skin test was positive and the RAS test was positive in 43, and they were both negative in 34, but there was discordance in this group here. And what that means is that if you want to be sure about the answer, or at least diagnose uh, sensitization, you probably need to do either a skin test or a blood test first, and then do the other test if it's negative, if you think that's the problem. And then when you look at the, what they're sensitized to, these again are severe asthmatics, good proportion are sensitized to just one fungus, but many are sensitized to multiple fungi. And the fungi that they're allergic to are, or sensitized to are varied. And there's quite a lot of variation. Now something else that happens to these patients, and it isn't exclusive to ABPA, but it's common with ABPA, is they have really, really thick, gooey sputum. It's a real big feature of these patients. It's sort of like, almost like chewing gum or jelly babies or slugs. I don't know if you have slugs in this country. Something sort of horrible that comes up. They're often brown. They may be, they may be clear or yellow like this with all the degraded uh, acidophils and neutrophils. And it presents ABPA sometimes as an acute exacerbation. So here is uh, a lady, uh, here's an example of a patient who had an acute exacerbation with an abnormal x-ray here. And then after steroids, a month later, that, that infiltrate is gone. And so these infiltrates that come and go are very typical. And if you were to do a bronchoscopy on everybody and look down, you'd see these plugs that are sit in the airways. And this woman had had ABPA since she was 10. And she had a lobectomy because it all got stuck. And she was absolutely couldn't get this plug up over three weeks. So you can also do a therapeutic bronchoscopy and remove the plug, and that's what happened to her. They had to grab the thing and pull the whole bronchoscope and the plug out, and get it out, and then go back in again to, 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 to wash it out. Sometimes it's really thick and horrible and gooey. And you can get an exacerbation that's visible on an x-ray. So this lady um, was on uh, intraconazole, which we use a lot for these patients, and has some localized bronchiectasis in the right upper lobe there but she wanted to have a baby. And you, you can't get pregnant on itraconazole. There's a higher rate of problems with the birth and a stillborn, and with fluconazole, there's a higher rate of um, phallus tetralogy, for example. So the patients, women who want to have a baby, can't stay on these drugs. So she came off, and she went through pregnancy fine, was breastfeeding, and then got sick. Presented with this lesion, the it wasn't under an R hospital, another hospital, they made a cardinal error while breastfeeding was to do a CT scan of her chest, which is massive radiation for the breasts and a big rise in risk of breast cancer. So we'll, I'll show you her scan, but it was completely plugged with stuff up there. And she got better finally, um, but what you also see is that after this exacerbation, her bronchiectasis is a great deal worse. So these plugs lead to worsening bronchiectasis, which is why we don't want patients to get relapses. We don't want these plugs there. 
This is another story of uh, something that shouldn't have been done. Um, this lady presented and she came in, was a, she was about 65 or something like that, and she, uh, it was an unresolving pneumonia, therefore poor in malignancy. Uh, she was seen by the surgeons, fast track to surgery, had a lobectomy, and they took a history from her, and she'd never had a history of asthma. So have you got asthma? And at, uh, at uh, the pathology, you see this lung, which is completely full of solid material, absolutely stuck down with this solid material. And when I went to see her afterwards, when they thought, oh, this wasn't cancer after all, I said, have you got asthma? She said, no, no, no. Have you got any inhalers? Oh, yes, I had this blue inhaler for quite a long time. <laughs> so sometimes patients don't know what the labels should be, and some of that's a problem. And this lady would have done fine with steroids and antifungals, not lost her lung. So it was a mistake. And so it is easy to make a mistake. Well, not easy, but it is possible. And in India, in particular, they have another characteristic which we don't have, which is hyperattenuated mucus. So this is the normal lung windows, and you can see these full airways, full of material. But when you look at the mediastinal or bone windows, you can see this hyperattenuated mucus here, which is highly characteristic of ABPA. It doesn't occur in any other disease. And it's very rare in Britain, in white people. It seems to be a particular feature of Indian people. And I don't know why, but it's a real problem, because when they get it, and this is a long, complicated slide, but the, the fact, the likelihood of relapse is five times higher if you have this hypertenuated mucus. And they also are more likely to require high dose of steroids, more likely to become diabetic, and that's a problem. So you take this plug out, and you send it off to the lab, and the lab will do direct microscopy, and you'll see these branching hyphae, Acinophils, and if you look a little bit more carefully, you'll see a very beautiful crystal, the Shaker Leyden crystal, which is based on the um, uh, breakdown product of one of the acinophilic proteins. And you see this sometimes in um, um, Aspergillus uh, sinusitis as well, allergic sinusitis, but it's very characteristic and it means it's a, lots of acinophils. And if you do fancy staining for acinophils, you can find lots of acinophils. So, although I told you that it was a neutrophil-driven asthma, uh, actually, there's lots of acinophils related to this disease as well. So the tests are not perfect, and you need a multiple set of tests to make a diagnosis. So the skin test positive 97%, sorry, 95% sensitivity, 80% specificity. IgE is pretty good, but it's not very specific. Um, the fumigator-specific IgE levels are highly sensitive, and therefore that's a necessary condition for the diagnosis, but not highly specific. The IgG antibodies are not quite so clear, but they are a bit more specific in this context. Acinophils find them quite often not very helpful. Bronchiectasis, fairly helpful, but it's a complication of ABPA, not there. These transient opacities are not seen in most patients, but they are pretty specific. And this high attenuation mucus, this study was done in India, 40% of the patients, but very specific if you find it. And what is also, they've also looked at is what the cutoff should be, and this is again in an Indian population, and the IgE level actually is quite low, 1.9, uh, to define this, but the IgE was 2,300, 2, so much higher than the 1,000 is there, and eosinophils are often very high. So this was an algorithm of how you approach this problem. So you're presented with a patient with asthma. That's a bit of a problem. They, you know, they're on their inhalers, they're on another set of inhalers, maybe they've attended the emergency room and had a nebulizer. They're a bit of a problem. So you screen, the screening test is the Aspergillus specific IgE. If that's negative, they almost certainly haven't got ABPA. Okay? They could have SAFs because because that is, it's not always fumigators, but they don't have ABPA if, they, if this test is in. If they're positive, then you can do a total IgE, and then you can work down doing scans and repeat tests to actually make the diagnosis. So the first best test is a specific IgE. Now, how does this disease occur? I don't want to spend a long time on the pathogenesis. It's pretty complicated and not fully understood. Um, you've got detection with TNR2 and 4, and possibly 9 as well, up in the cell membrane. And you've got then a CCL17 pathway, which involves a TH2 pathway, IL4, IL5. 
and you've got uh, uh, various ways that the steroids can interact down the key with all of these in inhibitors. You've got the antifungals that can reduce the growth of fungus in the airways, and you've got omaluzumab that's acting directly on IgE. Now, omaluzumab isn't actually indicated for ABP because you have to think of a very big dose and it's expensive, but it is there. We did a touch of work on something called pro platelet basic protein, uh, PPPB, um, which is CXCL7, and we found that these patients had very high levels of this protein, really quite high levels in their macrophages, but not in their DALs, or not different to their DALs. And so there may, be, there may be other factors which are not in the diagram that are relevant. We've, um, and I actually think I'll skip that. And we've also found a role, as, as others have, I think, in IL-17. So you get quite a lot of IL-17 produced in both peripheral cells and the ALs in these patients. APA staffs in severe asthma, but less so in mild asthma. Um, but what about sensitization? So I've mentioned a bit about sensitization, and there's quite interesting article um, from a couple of Japanese people looked at this. And the, one of the things to note, this is malazetsia, which is a skin fungus, a little yeast that's in the skin, causes um, separate dermatitis, worse in HIV and AIDS often. And you can see that as you get older, sensitization to that falls. And it also falls to penicillium, and it falls to alternaria and slightly to the other factors. Whereas albicans doesn't change, and nor does aspergillus very much over time, over age. But there's remarkably few data on this. So if you wanted to do some studies on fungal sensitization in uh, Uganda, you'd be the first in Africa to do such studies, because they haven't been done. Uh, they just aren't, are not there. Now, aspergillus, I've told you it's special for a couple of reasons, but it's also special for another reason, and that is that if you look at the different uh, proteins which uh, induce an IgE response, in fumigators you've got 46 IgE binding proteins. In a cat you have one. The house dust might be two. So this is an incredibly allergenic organism. Lots and lots and lots of uh, allergenic proteins, and that's a challenge, I think. And when you, um, um, when you do a genomic analysis of these uh, uh, proteins, you find that some of them are shared across all the kingdoms. So you've got thyroidoxin, uh, uh, HR protein, manganese, sulfite, <coughs> dismutase, and so on, which are shared. And then you've got a group here which are shared amongst the fungi only. And you've got others which are just plant allergens. And so there's inevitably quite a lot of cross-reactivity with these things, and that also means that the specificity is not as good as we would like for some of the tests. And the sensitization extends not just to asthma. So this was a study where they looked at um, uh, sensitization in patients who had COPD, and you can see that the sensitized patients here, and there were quite a lot of them, had worse lung function. So COPD is also associated with worse lung function, as it is in asthma. And um, if you look at, uh, this is the, the sputin acinophils, it's not particularly associated with sputin acinophils, maybe just, but not really. So it's, again, it's not acinophilic driven, but they're sensitized and their lung function is a bit worse. And it's been shown after TB as well. This was a, an Indian study, and their skin tests were positive in 24% in of patients who had TB. So TB can lead to sensitization. And also that leads to worse lung function as well, with quite a big odds ratio. Do we understand it? No. We do not understand it. We don't understand this link between sensitization and worse lung function. And there's some more work to be done. And to make life more confusing, uh, because uh, that's my job in life in part, to make life confusing, so you've got 62 uh, bronchoscopies, lots of different patients that we analysed, including eight healthy people who volunteered for a bronchoscopy. Wasn't that nice of them? Um, and this is a complicated diagram, which I'll explain. So here are your healthy patients here. And this group is the how much fungus they've got in their airways. You can see some of them have a bit of fungus in their airways. And they have quite a variety of fungus in the areas. The green is aspergillus, 
The blue is a Malazetia type of fungus, which is probably a normal inhabitant of, of, of many people's lungs. And if you compare that, for example, with severe asthma, some of these have staggeringly large amounts of fungus in their areas, but not all of them, some of them. And the same is true for saps, really high levels of fungus, and it's almost all aspergillus. Interesting, the ABPA patients were not so affected, so it's surprising. So that may be because it's more of an immune thing. And the other thing is that if you give steroids to these patients, you increase the amount of fungus in their lungs. So how do we treat asthma? With steroids. And what do you do? You increase the amount of fungus in their lungs. It's brilliant. Um, and that relationship isn't well understood either. All right? That is, we, we think we know why you get more fungus, because actually aspergillus grows faster than we have more with aspergillus steroids. But the other very remarkable thing is that if you look at the individual strains of aspergillus fumigatus, as determined by SNPs, patients have incredibly large numbers of, 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 sort of whole families or you know, um, villages of aspergillus living in their lungs. So this patient had 458 varieties of aspergillus fumigatus in her lungs. So it isn't just the one fungus. And yet when you do a culture in the lab, you grow one colony, two colony, four colonies, so you have grow a small number. So we miss a lot with culture. And just to remind you, the patients with really high IgE may have another disease called Joe syndrome or hyper IgE syndrome, where you get staphylococcal abscesses in association with it, funny teeth, and uh, quite bad bronchiectasis. Okay, so you, we now imagine you have a patient with ADP, documented ADP, and you can have various different outcomes from that, including resolution and remission, recurrent exacerbations, bronchiectasis. Hyperattenuation of mucus, as I've talked about, chronic pulmonary exposurosis, which I'll talk about, and poor asthma control. So lots of different complications from this. And if you have SATs, you have some of these, you can resolve, you can have exacerbations, you can have chronic pulmonary exposurosis, but your characteristic feature is poor asthma control. That's the, the big problem. So you've got overlapping but different um, uh, things. <coughs> So this is a, oh, I think I've showed you this patient. I was going to show you another, uh, sorry, I forgot that. That was the scan on that page. So, and this is what, this is an example of chronic pulmonary specialosis following ABPA. This is a man who's actually, he's a builder, this man, and, uh, and he's still working, he's still coming to clinic, and his x ray's not changed in 10 years. We've kept him on nitroconazole. But you see the plural, the fibrosis based APCs with multiple cavities up there, and he's got chronic pulmonary specialosis which in the old literature was called uh, uh, lung shrinkage and uh, uh, upper lobe fibrosis. It was given other terms. We, we thought chronic cavitary pulmonary specialosis was a better phraseology because it implies that you need to treat the patient as opposed to just describing it on the X-ray. So this is a lady who had her first attack of ABPA when she was 10, and she was admitted to the sanatorium. And this was in the 1966. And she has a normal x-ray, virtually normal x-ray at that stage. She then has an exacerbation of ABPA, and she's got an abnormality in her lungs uh, over here. You can see this area right here, three years later. And she goes through her life with these multiple exacerbations. But if you look at the pleura, the, how sharp the pleura is up here over time, you'll see that it changes. And this was in... Uh, 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 1981, this is in 1985, and now you definitely see this pleural capping up here, or fibrosis up here, and that's 95, that's worse, and she's got quite a bad bronchiectasis now, she's definitely got some disease up here as well, that's 2002, she's clearly got bilateral disease in those areas there, and this woman is still coming to clinic. She's not moved away from around our hospital. She started, she's born locally, she's still coming to clinic. And in 2002, I put her on intracortisol. She's still taking it, and her x-ray is identical, 16 years later. So I don't know how long you treat, but I don't stop if patients are doing well, and particularly if they've got these complications of baby So here's, a, here's another x-ray. So this patient's 
got TB, eh? Do you agree with that? Comfortable with that? Upper lobe thing? No? Not sure? Maybe? It's not quite typical, is it? Not typical. It looks sort of, there's a bit of pleural thickening up there. It looks sort of like a little bit of a hole. Maybe it's not typical. Um, what about this one? Doesn't that look like TB? Bad TB? Yeah. yeah. Well, he's had TB twice, so you're quite right. However, it's much worse the x-ray than it was a year ago. It's progressed a lot. And they've looked for TB the third time. Can't find it anywhere. And so he's got, only got a cough. It's not too bad. He's still working. But his Asperger's IgG antibody was really high. It was 190 and it should be only 40. Normal inflammatory markers. And then he had a CT scan because they didn't know what was wrong with him. And you can see he's got very remarkable pleural thickness. And that pleural thickening doesn't really occur with TB. I mean, you might get a touch, but you don't get massive pleural thickening like this. And that's what you're looking at. It's really thick pleural. So for me, there's absolutely no doubt this man has chronic pulmonary asperglosis. Absolutely no doubt. So he's had TB twice, he's had his lung insult, because usually how lung insult, and then he's now got a complication of that. And the key test is that aspergillus IgG antibody. The doctors still didn't know what's wrong, so they did a PET scan, which I guess you don't do here very often, uh, and we don't do on our patients either. But it's very interesting because it shows you how much inflammation there is around the lungs here, massive inflammation around the lungs. With a normal plasma viscosity, normal CRP, so no inflammation, just a cough, and yet this really tremendous inflammatory response. And this man, if we don't treat him, will just get worse. And there is another one, um, if I'm using the PET scan, not because I can recommend you to do it, but because it illustrates the point. And here you have a cavity with lots of bumpy little holes, and this is all fungus in growing inside here. That's all fungal material. And if you were to take that lung out or put a little endoscope inside and have a good look, you would see this, um, this plaques of fungus inside the airway, and histologically you see these uh, sort of coats of it. And if you don't treat, then what happens is this. This is over a five year period. Post TB, this lady, she's an Indian lady from Gujarat. Um, cavitation, progression, big fungal ball developing, and she's lost the whole lot. So she's fibrosed the whole of her left lung as a consequence of chronic pulmonary spasmosis. So imagine if you saw one of these patients now, at that stage, you'd say destroyed lung prior TB. Both of those statements would be correct. That's correct. She's got destroyed lungs. She's had TB. That's right. But what you missed is that she's actually got chronic pulmonary spasmosis, which is why she's losing weight. She can't. She's very tired. She can't do anything. She's coughing all the time. And many of them cough up blood as well. Now, Bruce joined us in Liverpool uh, a year and a bit ago. And we devised an algorithm for how would you get to the diagnosis of chronic pulmonary spasmosis uh, in a low middle income setting, a low resource setting. So you start with cough, hemoptysis, or weight loss for three months. Okay? So many of your TB patients will present in a shorter time frame than that. Um, and hemoptysis is particularly common in chronic pulmonary specialists. Of course, it can occur in bronchiectasis and lung cancer and TB, of course it can, but it's particularly common in chronic pulmonary specialists. So you do a chest x ray. Of course you do. If it's normal, or nearly normal, then they've got something else wrong with them. They're losing weight, uh, maybe they've got systemic disease of some sort. If you've got consolidation, you know, like that, then have you got APPA, have you got lung cancer, have you got unresolved pneumonia, <coughs> what, something else, airways obstructed, they swallowed a peanut and obstructed their way, what, what is wrong with them? But if they have cavitation and thoracic with or without a fungal wall or pericavitary fibrosis, then of course you'll do what you always do, which is to look for TB. But if that's negative and you've got that feature, then you really need to do an antibody test for Aspergillus, an IgG antibody test. And uh, that will make a diagnosis of chronic pulmonary specialists. And we have suggested that 
in, in guidelines published about two years ago, that radiologists, if they see these features, should mention aspergillus because nobody actually, all they do is look for TB and they've got upper lobe fibrosis and some sort of dis descriptive words, but not very helpful. So the other thing you get, of course, is called the ectasis complicating ABPA. So these very saccular airways, it can be localized. It, it, it's described as being central, that is near the pilot, but actually it doesn't can be anywhere. And they cough up all this horrible green stuff or have a little hemoptysis as well. So what we try and do is we try and treat these patients. And we have essentially five strategies to try and do. The first thing <coughs> is to avoid them. So if they live in a very moldy house, damp environment, then we try and remove that. In Britain, we, um, these patients, we recommend that they change their pillows every six months because sometimes the pillow is full of fungus, sometimes their bedding is full of fungus, and so there are ways of trying to reduce the exposure, which is helpful. We want to control the inflammatory response, of course, steroids are one of the ways of doing that, uh, although there are others, and certainly inhaled steroids for asthmatics. You want to improve their airflow obstruction by getting rid of the mucus and retention, you want to reduce the fungal burden, and I'll come back to that. And then, of course, they often get bacterial infection as well. So when we breathe in, we think about, or maybe we think about, you breathe in spores of fungus, but in fact, we also breathe in, in fragments of dead, destroyed fungus with allergens on their surface. So when you have this massive exposure, you're getting direct <coughs> allergen exposure, and that's driving asthma. So that's the reason for the avoidance issues, if we can do it. The IDSA published guidelines 2016, and they uh, mention ADPA itraconazole, use of voriconazole or posaconazole, depending on the formulation, as substitutes. That's their sort of the current recommendation. And there have been several studies that have been looked at, the several randomized studies that have looked at the treatment of ADPA or SAFs, fungal acid. And natamycin in inhalation was not useful. That was the first study, very small British study, but no signal there. Then there were two good ADP studies I'll mention. Then there's this small trichophyton study I'll mention. We did a study in SAPS, which was beneficial, which I'll show you. There was a shorter study with voriconazole, which was not helpful, but it wasn't very well designed, that study. There's a rand inhaled antitericin study, which showed benefit. And then recently, a comparison of itraconazole versus steroids was shown to be of benefit. So um, this is probably the smallest significant randomized control study you'll ever see. 11 patients randomized to fluconazole placebo and a highly significant result in that time. So wouldn't you like to do an RCT with 11 patients and be able to publish a nice paper? And most of them are 200 patients or something. So what that tells you is that this was a very big effect, really a very big effect. And these are all patients actually who also had skin problems. So those of you who are chest physicians and you're worried about your asthmatic patient, you need to address them, which I know you don't do. I mean, I know you look at this bit of them, but you need to look at their toenails and their feet. And have you got ringworm? Have you got scalp problems? Have you got fungus anywhere else? Because these patients, if you treat the, the skin fungus, will help their asthma. Okay. Then there was a randomized study done in uh, the States comparing intraconazole placebo for 16 weeks, and then all the patients got intraconazole. And overall, 61% um, uh, of the patients responded, which is not bad, you better. And the number needed to treat is 3.6, so quite low. And then there was another study, similar design, but they didn't do the second phase with itraconazole. <laughs> they looked at sputum acinophils, and they came down uh, there. And you can also see that they uh, benefited with reduced exacerbations, but they didn't get a change in uh, airways obstruction. FEV1 didn't change. We did a small retrospective study um, looking at patients with SAFs and ABPA. And the IgE falls, the RAS test falls, the acinophils fall, and the FEV1 improve in both groups of patients, but the numbers are just different in SAFs versus uh, abnormals. And then the RCT that we did with itraconazole for SAFs 
um, which was eight months of therapy, and then they stopped therapy, also shows benefit with a quality of life measure. Um, and that quality of life was not quite superior because there was overlapping confidence intervals at this time frame. But once they stop therapy, what you get is you get relapse. And many of these patients relapse, which is why we, we tend to give longer term treatment. And in that study, the change in AQLQ score was 8.85. 54% of patients had a very good improvement compared with some controls. Or in asthma, you always have to have controls because there's a big placebo response in, in asthma. But the number needed to treat here was 3.2, which is a really good low number for treatment for success. So if you compare that quality of life endpoint with steroids, which is this phase here, or omeluzumab, which is this phase here in a, uh, a follow-up study to the original omeluzumab studies, the steroids give you a benefit of 0.6 and omeluzumab 0.4. Intraconazole gives you 0.85. And we also, for patients who can't take a or fail therapy, we've tried them on nebulized conventional aftericin B. Um, and the, a lot of them can't take it because of bronchospasm. And about 14% have significant benefit. And some of them have, are very good on nebulized aftericin B, just a very small proportion. And then this recent randomized study looked at exacerbations. Should I give them steroids? Should I give them intraconazole? They randomized about uh, 130 patients, and they followed them for one and two years. And what you can see is that the response rates for steroids was 100%, but it was 88% with intracorosol. So intracorosol also works for an increased estimation, which was a surprise to the authors. They weren't expecting that. But they also found lots and lots and lots of side effects with the steroids. So uh, I think three of these patients went on to get diabetes and various other things. So there's a sort of a, 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 an issue there. And then when they stop therapy, both groups relapsed. Uh, almost all of them relapsed, but it took two years to relapse. So you don't, you don't get an immediate relapse, you get that. Now, I don't know how many of you used it, itraconazole, but there's a one very important caveat about itraconazole usage, and that's the um, interaction with inhaled steroids. So you've got a, it produces the metabolism of the inhaled steroids, so you get a Cushing-like syndrome. So I've got my patient on, I don't know, flexotide, 500, two puffs twice a day, and they've got an exacerbation. I put them on intraconazole. What do I do then? Well, first of all, I see, can they take it? And I let them go for about a month. And if they can take the intraconazole, I haven't got a bad side effect, then I halve the inhaled steroids at that stage. And then I go another month or two, Checking that their liver tests and that they've got no other problems with the as well. Check their blood pressure because you get hypertension, check their liver tests, potassium. And if I can, what they then do is I try and bring that down, minimize their inhaled steroid dose. And you can bring it way down on intracorosal. So um, we've got, we run the Asperger's website, we have done for its 20 year anniversary this year, this, which is quite uh, something. There's about 100,000 people who look at it every month across the world. But we've also got on that an app, a drug interaction app, and you can put it on your phone. And um, I know all of you are super clever, excellent memories, no doubt about that. But I challenge you to remember 2,216 drug interactions <laughs> off the top of your head. <laughs> uh, I certainly I can't. <laughs> so, this is quite a good way of looking things up and looking things up, check, 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 check. So when you start intraconazole, and actually this is true for voriconazole and the other ones as well, you can check, check, check very quickly. We also run the Life website. Many of you have been on this and used it. You might recognize this young man uh, here. Um, and uh, uh, he's, he's got an arrow in front of his lips there, but he's very good, very knowledgeable about cryptococcal meningitis, David Mayer. So, <laughs> um, and this is designed to produce a sort of simple summary of fungal disease for almost anybody in the health professions. It's not really for the public, but it's for the health professions. So you can look up very quickly, and in, you know, 400 words, that's what candida peritonitis is, or that's what sporotrichosis is, or something like that. So it's quite quick. There's a drug interaction link on there. There's a link to every diagnostic <laughs> test that's commercially available. 
There's a link to all the drugs. There's a link to stuff on steroids and the use of steroids in fungal disease and surgery. So there's quite a lot of things. And then we've also recently launched a microscopy course. Um, so those of you who work in the labs can uh, uh, get really quite expert at direct microscopy on um, respiratory samples or uh, aspirations of pus. And then there's a histology section for easier common fungi and common fungi. And this is, if you don't want to do it in English, you can do it in um, Spanish, French or Portuguese. Um, with that, I'm going to stop.